students spent three or four years debating how many teeth a horse has. Nobody went out to actually count them, you know. <laughs> they just wasted all that time <laughs> debating how many teeth a horse has. So he thought, saw, saw that as fruitless, wasn't producing anything good or useful, and um, humanity just was not evolving, and there's so many people in poverty and sickness. So that's, he wanted to relieve that poverty and sickness and, um, and get us to, towards a future paradise, a world paradise, not just for, the, for the England, but for the world. So he, he really started the whole principles of modern science, which is this experimental method. And then he had um, a formula to you know, start with the basic, basics, the physical world, which is physics, physical laws, and then work upwards towards metaphysics and so on. He couldn't talk too openly when it got to metaphysics because it landed him in trouble with the religions of the time who were at war with each other. So he, he had to do that in a more careful way, more veiled way. But right about it, he did. Bacon's metaphysical ideas led him into teachings that would have been condemned by both the Catholic and Protestant churches of his day. He is said to have made contact with the spirit realm and that upon hearing a heavenly voice, he was given his life's work. To protect himself, he kept his practices veiled within secret societies. In particular, the ancient brotherhood of the Rose and Cross. The Rosicrucians had long believed that powers and principalities from the spirit realm possess secret knowledge that might be used for the benefit of mankind. These and other teachings were to be kept hidden from those considered profane and especially from the church. The Rosicrucians had to be a secret society. Their object was to go discover God's truths after him. But some of their methodology was bordering on witchcraft. For instance, the transmutation of base metals into gold. They claimed they could do it. Um, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, they, they claimed that they could communicate with angels and demons. Well, in the first place, the scripture tells you not to do it. But their idea was that if you could do that, surely those people, those, those creatures at least, the angels and the demons, they know a lot of things that we don't know. After all, they've been around since time immemorial. And they are familiar with heaven itself, so surely they can tell us many secrets. Well, the church, you see, would take a dim view of that, and they could be put to death for that sort of thing. The Rosicrucian Society had been formed in England prior to Bacon's birth, in part for the purpose of protecting Queen Elizabeth I. In the 16th century, the conflict between Roman Catholicism and the Protestant Church of England was at its peak. Mary Tudor, the daughter of King Henry VIII, took the throne and earned the title Bloody Mary. They were looking for another heir, and so there were no boy heirs of, um, or no legal boy heirs of Henry, but he had daughters. And uh, so we have Mary. And Mary was now 37, she was one of his daughters, and so she was installed as queen, and that was um, just after he died, so that would be in 58. And she was a Catholic, a dyed-in-the-wool Catholic, and she had actually married uh, Prince Philip II of Spain. Of course, he was a Catholic too. So the first thing that Mary did was to repeal those laws which permitted the Protestants to practice their religion, repealed them, and then forcefully put to death as many Christians that were of the Protestant faith as she could find. Within the uh, confines of the data that we have, she put to death 300, so there was 300 martyrs there that we know about in this in the short six-year reign that she had. No one was safe from Mary's wrath against the so-called Protestant heretics, not even her own sister. Elizabeth Tudor was also the daughter of King Henry VIII, with his second wife, Anne Boleyn, whom Henry had married after divorcing Catherine of Aragon, the mother of Queen Mary. When she was installed as queen, she put her sister, Elizabeth I, in jail because she was suspected of being a Protestant, so she went to the Tower of London. 
While imprisoned in the tower, Elizabeth formed a friendship with a mysterious member of the court, a mathematician and mystic named Dr. John Dee. He was known in the early Elizabethan days as, as the real wise man, the Magus, um, and he was into a lot of esoteric study. Um, you know, he, he, he was certainly an initiate of the wisdom traditions. Dr. John Dee was one of the foremost geniuses of his day. John Dee was 34 years older than Francis Bacon, and um, John Dee was a mathematician, lived in London. He was a mathematician and astrologer to Queen Mary Tudor. Uh, that's Bloody Mary. While Dee began in Mary's service, he soon fell out of favor because of his bizarre experiments and some say his friendship with Elizabeth. In any case, Dee was imprisoned under suspicion of sorcery, an accusation that would follow him throughout his life, and one that seems not unfounded considering his system of magic is still practiced by many occultists to this day. One thing that he is most noted for today among cultists is that he and a fellow named Edward Kelly, who was a medium, uh, did magical invocations uh, related to the Book of Enoch to produce an entire, what today is called, Enochian system of magic. And it's this incredibly complex language and uh, alphabet and cubes and magic squares, and it's, it's extremely complex and it's very, very powerful. In his quest for knowledge, Dee tapped into the powers of the beyond, hoping to learn secrets from the spirit realm. But that's not to say he wasn't trying to communicate with angels, he did. And they can be contacted and talked with. They're, roughly it means messengers of God. So that's what Dee was trying to do in his own way. But um, he obviously was too open about it, so in the end he got um, persecuted for this. But not everyone saw Dee's dabbling as communicating with angels of God. Dee once wrote that he was looked upon as a companion of hellhounds, a caller and a conjurer of wicked and damned spirits. Yet like Bacon, he practiced much of his craft in secret as an active member of the Rosicrucians in England. Some even credit Dee with founding the modern Rosicrucian movement. As such, communing with angelic beings that provide scientific knowledge was a familiar practice. Now, there was a, a pretty, uh, very brief and shady dividing line between what they called scientific knowledge and what we might call outright witchcraft today. It was a, the, the demarcation there was very shadowy. This shadowy line was one that Dee crossed many times. Yet for a while, he flourished under the reign of Queen Elizabeth. During this era, some believe that he was a kind of mentor to Sir Francis Bacon. Well, we know from Dee's diary that Bacon made one visit, at least, to um, Dr. John Dee's home at Mortlake. And when, when these visits were recorded. Dee was meaning people had come to talk with Dee and discuss esoteric matters with him and to use his library and so on like that. So we know that that's a historical record we have. Otherwise, it's, it's circumstantial evidence. Um, Bacon clearly knew Dr. John Dee because he was an important person in Queen Elizabeth's court and Francis Bacon was a courtier. Perhaps the reason for the lack of records in Bacon's relationship with John Dee is that their work was done behind the veil of secret societies. There's always been these secret societies trying to promote learning and, um, and raise the level of people's thought and culture to a kinder level and higher level. But mostly they've worked in secret because the church, most, most of the different churches have been so um, 